Let's go over a couple practice test questions. And in so doing, I'll show a couple of the tips and tricks and techniques that I use when I take the exam. We'll start with question one. A security administrator uses a packet sniffer to troubleshoot a remote authentication issue. The administrator detects a computer trying to communicate on TCP port 49. Which of the following authentication methods is most likely being attempted? Well, you notice that I was putting some emphasis on some of the words here, but let's look at the possible answers. First is Kerberos. Next is Radius. Then TACAX Plus and LDAP. So which one do you think is the correct answer? Well, if you really, if you know your ports, you should know the answer is going to be TACAX Plus, and that's uh, Cisco's protocol for authenticating uh, in a remote fashion. So that's done on TCP port 49. So TACAX Plus, TACACS Plus uses port 49, and it's using, normally it uses TCP as a transport mechanism. Now, if we go a little further with this, you know, we can use, first of all, the process of elimination just by going by the port numbers. Kerberos uses port 88. And so we know in the question we see port 49. So, you know, we know for, port 49 is going to be TAC, ACS plus. Kerberos, that uses 88. Radius, it depends on the implementation, but it's going to use 1812 and 1813 or 1645 and 1646. The other thing about radius is that it normally by default uses UDP as opposed to TCP. So it uses a connectionless uh, transport mechanism. It can use TCP, but by default it uses UDP. LDAP, LDAP uses port 389, unless you're talking about secure LDAP, that's 636. But you know, 389, totally different port numbers altogether. Now you could look at this another way also. You could say, all right, this was asking for remote authentication. And, you know, the only real possible answers for that are going to be TACAX Plus and Radius. Kerberos and LDAP are usually used on the LAN, for example, in a domain. So you could look at it from the port number, the transport mechanism, or the fact that this is a remote connection. You know, all the rest of it is just a bunch of jazz. You know, okay, there's an administrator that used a packet sniffer to troubleshoot and blah, 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 blah. Basically, what we're looking here is the port. That's what you're zeroing in on for this particular question. Now, true and false questions are great, but the key is to know this stuff in a hands-on manner. That's what's going to help you in the field. So, you know, you want to be able to work on this stuff if you can. So, for example, if you can get your hands on a Cisco router and work on TACAX Plus, uh, load that up, load that remote authentication protocol. If you can get your hands on a Microsoft server and work on a Radius, install a remote authentication box. Uh, you know, and if you can't, there's always simulations and emulators for Cisco in the command line. And then there's always uh, eval copies of Windows Server that you can download, which I highly recommend. And then Kerberos, you know, you can run that on a Windows server as well as uh, Linux, Unix boxes. And LDAP, you can run that on a Windows server. And, um, you know, you can uh, use that in email servers and that type of thing as well. You know, with some of these, for example, with Kerberos and with LDAP, you're going to want to upgrade the server to a domain controller if you're using Microsoft. But this is the kind of thing you want to do. You want to work in a hands-on manner. That's what's going to help you to really learn this stuff. And as far as the ports, you can get a listing of ports in a variety of places on the internet. Of course, it's in the book as well in uh, chapter six. But, you know, if we go to the IANA, you'll see a whole listing of ports. You know, you could do a quick search for this on Google or wherever, but you'll find a whole list of all the ports. We can go to second page here and you'll see TACAX 49 TCP. That's the standard. You can also use UDP, but it generally uses TCP connection oriented. You want to find out about others. Uh, you can type in the, um, the protocol name, for example, radius, 
and scroll down and it'll show the various ports that Radius could possibly use. Um, again, the standard ones are 1812 and 1813 and normally in a UDP format, but doesn't have to be. So this is definitely a good site to go to. Okay, question two, bring this up now. Input validation is an important security measure because it blank. And let's look at the possible answers. A, it protects misconfigured web servers. B, rejects bad or malformed data. C, enables verbose error reporting. And D, prevents uh, denial of service attacks. So what could be the answer here? Do, 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 do. Well, we got to look at this as from a programmer's standpoint, from a developer's standpoint. Why are we using input validation? Most commonly, we are using it in forms on, say, a web server or another type of server. Uh, but generally, websites, and you're talking about, say, PHP or CGI forms or ASP forms, that's when we're using input validation. But we don't want to get fooled by this where it says web servers. You know, it's not going to protect an entire web server. What it's going to do is it's going to reject bad or malformed data. And by that, we mean someone who is trying to insert some code in there, someone who is trying to do a, uh, an XSS attack or something of that nature. You know, bad code, uh, improper code. You want to have your PHP pages, your CGI pages, whatever other pages you're running your forms off of, you want to have them properly validating this code and make sure that people can't add any additional stuff that they're not supposed to. You know, when they do that, they're trying to get access to the server. So let's remember that question two is about input validation. Let's just uh, keep that in mind for a little bit. Uh, but the other answer here, again, protects misconfigured web servers. Um, it's not really that the web server is misconfigured. It's that the form wasn't properly input validated. It wasn't validated properly. It wasn't coded properly. So I don't think you can call that misconfigured. Enables verbose error reporting. Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with that. There's a lot of ways to increase the verbosity of error reporting. And, um, you know, that means more wordy, more information. Uh, you know, you could do that for when a computer boots up, or you could do that for log files, all types of things. But that really has nothing to do with the question. And prevents uh, denial of service attacks. Well, the denial of service attack doesn't happen through a form, but other attacks can possibly happen through the form. So, but denial of service attacks, you know, you're going to block those with your firewall, with your IDS, IPS solution, um, that type of thing. So let's move on to the uh, next question. It's question three, which of the following is an important consideration when deploying a wireless network? that uses a shared password? And the answers are A, key length, B, server certificate, C, EAP method, and D, authentication server. Well, let's take a look here. We're looking at shared passwords. So what are passwords gonna be based on? What are we talking about by shared password? Well, we're most likely talking about a wireless network that has wireless clients connect, and they connect, say, with WPA or WPA2, which uses a PSK, a pre-shared key. And the length of that key will be very important in keeping a secure network. You know, the, the more complex that passphrase, the better. So that should be the answer, key length. Server certificates aren't necessarily going to be used. Um, if we're using a shared password, we're not really worried about a certificate. We're using a radius server or something like that. That would be taking it to the next level beyond that PSK. And the EAP methods, that's something that's going to be a completely different subject altogether. Um, say if you're using 802.1x or something else, uh, you, can, you might use the uh, EAP for authentication but it's not gonna deal with a shared password. And then an authentication server, such as a Radius server or another type of server that does authentication, uh, again, you're not gonna have that shared password. Whenever you have that 
authentication server and say a server certificate, there's going to be separate keys and separate passwords and separate certificates. And that's the idea behind that, that you're not sharing this. So key length will be the answer for question three. Moving on to question four, a security consultant just completed a penetration test from the internet. The consultant was able to establish a connection to an internal router, but was not able to successfully log into that router. Which ports and protocols are most likely to be open within the organization's firewall? Select the four best answers. Well, it's another ports question, apparently. Let's look at the answers. A is port 21. B is port 22. C, port 23, D, port 69, E, port 3389, and now we have some uh, protocols. F is SSH, G is terminal services, H is R login, I is R sync, and J is telnet. So we've got a lot of answers here, and we have to select the four best answers. Chances are, we need to select some ports and their corresponding protocols. So if we take a look here, why would a person be logging onto a router? They want to make some type of connection to it. They want to log into it to, you know, maybe take control of it or to move data or capture data. Who knows? But how are they going to log into it? What are the common ways that a router would be logged into? Well, historically, Telnet was the first way. But over time, Telnet became deprecated because it was not secure enough. And a lot of people will use SSH to replace it. So that's your answer as far as the protocols. Now we just need to know the corresponding ports. And you got to memorize those. This is one of the reasons on the exam. So Telnet, well, that's port 23. And SSH, that's port 22. So we got ports 22 and port 23. We got SSH. And we got Telnet. We can pretty much use the process of elimination for the rest of these answers. We could say, okay, well, 21, that's FTP. First of all, FTP is not listed here. So we don't have a corresponding proto uh, protocol for the port. Uh, so 21 is out for that reason, but also because we don't use FTP to log into a router. We That's not what we use. We're going to use Telnet. We're going to use... Uh, you know, a terminal emulation program of some sort. We're going to use SSH. 69, that's TFTP. Well, it's another FTP. This is more file transfer uh, protocols. Again, we're not going to use that with the internal router. So 69 is out. 3389, that's RDP. That's re remote desktop protocol. And we use that to connect to other computers, but not to a router. Not to a, your typical black box router, we should say. Terminal services is 3389. Terminal services is the old name for remote desktop services. Uh, and the actual protocol is remote desktop protocol, or RDP. R login and R sync are used on Linux and Unix computers to log into Unix Linux systems and to synchronize files between your computer and those systems. So we know what all these things are, so we can use the process of elimination and say, okay, to connect to that router, we're going to use SSH on port 22 or the deprecated Telnet on port 23. And, you know, if nobody wants the router to be logged into, then these things are going to be blocked. And the firewall has apparently uh, let the uh, connection through, but the logon didn't work at the actual router. Penetration tests are great to find this type of thing. Uh, so let's move on to the last question, question five. And that is, which of the following can best help to prevent cross-site scripting attacks and buffer overflows on a production system? Well, this is one of the techniques that I use sometimes in the exam. You'll remember that we had a question previously about a certain topic which probably will be the answer here. So let's look at the possible answers. A is anomaly, uh, excuse me, anomaly based HIDs, HIDS. B is NIDS, NIDS. 
C is input validation, which is jumping out at me. It's jumping off the page. And D is ECC, which seems like a pretty silly answer. But anyways, uh, the best answer that I'm looking at here is input validation. That's going to be the right answer. We already said before, when we were looking at the other question, that input validation can stop attacks within forms, such as CSS, uh, I should say XSS, cross-site scripting attacks, and uh, cross-site forgery and that kind of thing. And so we kind of answered this already by looking at the previous question. By knowing these questions and knowing the possible answers and knowing all these concepts, we can kind of connect them together a little bit. If you weren't sure about the other question about input validation, you could have marked it. And then once you saw this particular question, you'd be like, ah, there's a connection there. And it all starts to kind of coagulate a little bit better in the mind. So you can make these connections. Feel free to mark questions when you take the real exam. So input validation, that's the best answer here. HIDs and NIDs, they're not going to stop uh, cross-site scripting attacks or buffer overflows, they might detect them. And that's the key here. The letter D means detection. So they might detect them, but they're not going to prevent them. You need an HIPS or an NIPS to do that. So, you know, basic distinction there between detection and prevention. And finally, ECC, well, in computers, that can stand for a whole ton of things, but there's elliptic curve cryptography, which we could guess that this is what this means. And uh, generally, that's not going to have much to do with our forms and someone trying to do a buffer overflow within the form or on the website or a cross-site scripting attack. ECC could also have to do with uh, memory, but that also is not going to have anything to do with this particular question. And quite often, when you, when you look at questions, there's a lot of the time, there's one answer, maybe more than one, that you can just automatically eliminate as just completely nonsensical, but you should still run through it in your mind. Like, okay, what does that acronym stand for? What is it basically? Does it have any connection to any of the ideas in this question here? But generally you'll find one that you can eliminate pretty quickly. And that starts off your process of elimination. So there's uh, five questions. Um, just some quick tips and tricks on how I kind of approach the exams a little bit. Now, another thing is you're going to be looking at performance-based questions, and you need to practice on computers to be able to do the performance-based questions. And you want to do that because you need to know this stuff in the field. In order to work on this stuff in the IT field, you need to have a hands-on knowledge. You need to have that real-world skill. And that's why I've added the case studies into the book and the uh, supporting videos and the simulations on the disk. So definitely go through those. Work in a hands-on manner on your computers and networks and your security systems. And check out some of the additional content on my site, videos, stuff like that. Any bonus questions that come out later on, keep your eye out for that kind of thing. And uh, you know, try to just really think of things from a hands-on standpoint, from that scenario that you're actually doing this stuff. That's what's gonna help you with the performance-based questions. So that's about it for this video. Good luck on your exams. Feel free to contact me uh, at my website and let me know how you do. Take care.